welcome to another episode of In the Studio. I am here today with author Kwanu Kwane Karmu. Correct. Is that correct? Yep. All right. And um, Q, as he has graciously allowed me to <laughs> shorten his name, um, is the author of Witness, a civil war through the eyes of a child. And this is his personal story of uh, his experiences as an eight-year-old during the Liberian Civil War. And I have read the book. It is an amazing tale of survival and perseverance. Um, it's a very emotionally involving book. So uh, don't, you could definitely, it's gripping enough to read through in one sitting. But uh, I myself took breaks to absorb everything that was going on in the story. Um, it's really an incredible, incredible story. And he's here today with us to talk about his experiences, about the book. And he's also developed an educational program around the book um, that we'll discuss. Um, so welcome. Thank Manu. you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate, <laughs> appreciate your uh, welcoming me to the studio and for giving me the chance to further uh, expand on my story. Okay. So let's, I guess, let's start with, a, for the people who don't know, a little background on Liberia. Liberia is a country in Africa. Yes. And uh, it was founded? It was founded um, during the, the American colonization movement yes. um, back in uh, early 1820, uh, between around the 1820s. Right. So uh, not long when, after the United States got going. That's right. So They was, started Liberia. They started Liberia. And uh, the motivation for Liberia was pretty much when, when the slaves were freed, um, in America, there was a, a fright um, in the minds of uh, slave owners mm -hmm. that the slaves might revolt um, against them right. because of the news that came out of Haiti when the Haiti slaves revolted um, against their masters and the news came down to the South. So the pressure to, um, to give these slaves an opportunity to go back to Africa started to build up. Mm -hmm. uh, James Monroe was president at the time. Um, so during that time, uh, there was a campaign ran for free black slaves who wanted to go back to Africa. Um, uh, they were going to use the American, they created an American colonization movement. Mm -hmm. Francis Scott King uh, was also part of In Our Room when they were deciding. Um, you know, mm -hmm. of course, he wrote the, the Star Springer Banner. Uh, and President America. Monroe, as you mentioned. President Monroe. Um, and so this movement to go back to Africa started to build. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of free slaves caught on to it. Um, and then the ship, the journey to, to Africa started. When it got on that ship and boarded it to go to uh, West Africa, they landed in Sierra Leone, but the mosquitoes were so much, um, mm -hmm. uh, killed a lot, of, uh, a lot of the folks who were on, on the ship, that it sailed down a little further, and that's where they found Liberia. Um, when it got off that ship, they came on the, onto the land and established Liberia, um, mm -hmm. and here's where we were born. Um, in uh, 1822 when they started, and then in 1847, um, the, they, they got uh, independent from the United States. Right. Um, and America kind of became like big brother uh, for Liberia. Big brother to the country. Yeah. And uh, so just so people understand that although slavery was outlawed in the United States only in 1865, the, it, the international slave trade was outlawed much earlier, and this is the, the freed slaves that... Yeah. A lot of the slaves were either rescued from ships, from right. slave ships, uh, and then there were also freed uh, black men who had won their freedom other ways or had been granted their freedom. That's right. Um, and they were all part of the, the move of the people moving over there, craftsmen, tradesmen, farmers, people. Yeah. Um, and they're actually, I was surprised in reading up on the history, there's extensive records and correspondence of this time period. This is not an unknown Era. There's the many letters, documentations about the whole process, That's right. uh, who was on the ships, and people writing back about their experiences when they arrived. Yes, I mean, it's fascinating the history that's out there that just have not been fully published, um, yeah. or it's not, uh, a lot of people are not aware of this hidden history of uh, black history, uh, the movement back to Africa. Liberia mm -hmm. became the, almost like the united front for black Americans who went back. Mm -hmm. um, back then, there was no genealogy studies. Right. They were just going to a land that was created for them, and they found this land. And um, in a way, Liberia became the, the beacon of hope 
for uh, African Americans to find their way back to Africa. The ironic part thing about that story is that um, the first movement to go to Africa was almost like a forced movement by mm -hmm. uh, whites um, who were uh, leading the cause. Right. But then halfway through, a lot of blacks decided that they didn't want to go to Africa based on that movement anymore. They wanted to actually do it on their own. So they came together in Charleston and formed another group um, that put money together to buy their own ship to actually mm -hmm. go to Africa um, under, under this patriotism of going to Africa. So and, by choice rather than being sent there. Exactly. Right. And then by that time, the movement had been so widespread that there was another campaign by <laughs> whites who decided to slow the movement down. Because now they saw that a lot of blacks who were going to Africa, going to Liberia, was writing back to their family members and saying, guys, this is indeed the promised land for us. They felt mm -hmm. like, like the Jews who were, were, were promised the promised land uh, mm -hmm. from God. Uh, to them, they felt like Liberia was that promised land for them. And, and that movement just went widespread. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, sh the ship that was purchased by free blacks um, um, during that time to go back was called the Bark Azar uh, mm -hmm. out of Charleston, South Carolina. And when they got to Liberia, they started writing letters to their families. When the ship got back here, the whites stopped it from going back to Africa. So the, the back to Liberia movement just died after that. Uh, so at a certain part, all, all the migration stops because they're worried that everybody's going to go over exactly. there. Exactly. Right. It, it was just this, this sense of freedom that they felt when it got to Liberia. Uh, the folks, the black free slaves that went got really wealthy. They mm -hmm. were freed uh, mentally, physically. Um, when they got to Liberia, uh, they formed lots of wealth on the land. Mm -hmm. um, and they started trading with, um, with other countries. Um, they started their own government. Of course, they were really heavily influenced by the, by the, by the government of the United States when they got there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a twist to the story is that when they got to Liberia, instead of embracing the indigenous that they found in Liberia, um, they turned them into slaves. Yeah. So that's, there's a twist to the whole story when it got to Liberia. Um, so how, you know, that's kind of where a lot of the tension started to build over the years. Between the, what became known as the Americos, correct? The Americo Liberians, Right, yes. so they're the ones who have migrated over, they've established themselves. But of course, there were people in Africa already. Yeah, um, in Liberia. Uh, uh, native populations, the many, many different populations. That's right. And, uh, and the tensions were between them. There were that's different right. things going on. Yeah. So... But Liberia survives. It has a democratic government on and on for, oh, it was like 100 yeah. years practically, yeah. right? Pretty much. Or and more. It grew um, right with the United States, if you think right. about it, um, as it, as it was, from its establishment to where it became, it started really to, to grow democratically with the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, the system is like here. We have the same flag, um, mm -hmm. except we have one star. So it's really a, our capital city is Monrovia, after James mm -hmm. Monroe. A lot of our, our islands and the places around Liberia is named after United mm -hmm. States states, like uh, New Vir uh, Virginia, uh, Maryland. We have those type of places around Liberia as well. So it would be it, very familiar to if someone looking at the map, they hey, these are all named after American yes. places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then around in the 20s, um, Firestone, uh, made an agreement with Liberia to open an, an enormous, the largest in the world, rubber plantation Correct. to supply rubber for tires because now the automobile is becoming a huge thing in the, in the United States yeah. and around the world. Um, and then, of course, we hit World War II and rubber is in great demand for, right. for all sorts of things. Natural rubber is a resource that is the, the only good solution for many engineering problems, from gaskets to seals to waterproofing things to tires. That's right. Um, and Liberia's climate turns out to be perfect for the growing of rubber. So That's right. You have this huge plantation, and then things are going along, but then we hit 1980, mm -hmm. and what happens? We hit 1980. Um, you know, underneath this great development that's happened in Liberia, um, uh, underneath there's this stench of, of segregation that's, that's right. still there, right? You have the American Liberians who have, um, who have ruled and have become very wealthy um, on the backs of the native Liberians um, in Liberia. Because even with Firestone coming to Liberia, um, there was this sense of, of re, re, um, reintroduction of slavery 
in a way because um, the labor pool was really, really bad. Um, the American Liberians will, of course, mandate that everybody and their mother and child and their grandparents had to work for Firestone right. um, for like a penny a day. So they were, they were working at, for no cost and there was very bad condition. Um, the plantations were set up just like slavery in the United States. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was, was uh, although Firestone grew unanimously in Liberia, mm -hmm. um, this, this oppression mentality was still strong um, mm -hmm. coming from American Liberians. Who, um, who helped to establish the country. Um, so leading up to the 80s, that region and a lot of what was happening there was, was, was built in tension. Uh, the American Liberians uh, were ruling the society. There was a lot of corruption, of course, that was happening. Uh, the, the indigenous Liberian felt like they had no voice. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, in 1980, there was a coup d'etat that took place uh, with uh, Samuel Doe, who was a master surgeon, um, working at the Capitol um, at the time. And uh, there's a lot of uh, conspiracy behind what actually took place. Did he right. organize it by himself or what took place? Talbert, who was um, in power, became, was one of the most innovative president Liberia has ever had um, mm -hmm. up to that point. Um, he was the first person, president to actually open the door to allow the indigenous to, to come side by side with, with, mm -hmm. with the American Liberians. Um, of course, in the process of doing that, there was a lot of tension that, that was rising um, in his government from um, policies that he was trying to implement um, to allow Liberians to become more independent of the rest of the world um, and become more, to grow their own food effectively, make it a lot cheaper instead of importing rice. He wanted every Liberian to grow rice, we got a climate just it's to great be self sufficient. Yeah. Yes, but there's a lot of tension that, that was building on that front as well um, that he ran into, and unfortunately, um, it could not be resolved uh, peacefully. Um, and though led a, a movement to overtake uh, Topper, um, and when that took place, that was the beginning of our trauma. Um, you know, when Which continues when it, for the next. 40 years. On and off. Well, you can say that years. 2020, this year, is critical. It marked uh, 40 years of struggle uh, since that time, from 1980 to 2020, um, this year that we're in. So when, that, when the coup d'etat took place, of course, patriotically, from the, from the everyday people, they felt like they had been suppressed for a long time, mm -hmm. that somehow, some way, maybe because of this, this um, uh, indigenous leader who came into power, he would then become their savior. He, he would right. become the, the person who would tie um, everything together for Liberians and the indigenous and local Liberians that feel like they have a sense of power mm -hmm. um, to be able to feel a sense of freedom in the country. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, when he got into power, everything started to change. Um, he became very corrupt. Of course, um, this is Doe. Is this is Doe. He's taken over now. And yep. And, and, the coup. <laughs> and then he's, he, ironically, he's supported um, by the U.S., um, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where a lot of gray line is, is, is kind of, you know, you got to kind of read between the lines to figure out what's going on right. um, at that time. So he comes into power. Uh, Doe is actually flown to Washington, D.C., uh, uh, meets with Reagan at the White House. Um, and he goes back to Liberia, essentially become one of the richest presidents in the world. Um, how does he get all this money? Um, of course, you know, uh, that's still yet to be said um, right. in, in many ways. But Doe goes back um, and starts to, to suppress a lot of people, even including mm -hmm. his own people. Um, starts to um, really staunchly uh, divide a country within itself, uh, tribally, um, you know, favoritism to his own type of tribal people over other people. So the country itself is in this melting pot at this moment. Um, and throughout the 80s, we're experiencing tension, but right. the, the, the overshadow of what's happening in Liberia is still peace. It's still a very, very beautiful country. Right. Um, and the people of Liberia don't really, they can't, they, they're, not, they're, they're not transported to this area where they can realize that this tension is going to catch up to them 
because they still deny that because of the umbrella of the U.S., um, we will be protected, that, that even though we're hearing rumors of suppression, that it will all just pass away, everybody right. will be okay. Because um, the U.S. wouldn't let anything bad as, happen. Right? Exactly. Of course. Exactly. <laughs> Firestone presence is heavy in Liberia yeah. as well at this time. So there's a lot of, and, and life is really good. I mean, uh, in Liberia, regardless of all of what was happening, the sense of Liberia was a beacon, beacon of hope for a lot of African countries for what democracy should be like in Africa and right. for what... Uh, it was Africa's first and uh, yeah. oldest republic. That's right. And, and late, it, it, there's a lot of accomplishment that Liberia have had up to this point, uh, regardless of, of, of the suppressive um, government that was there um, all, all of this time. There was a lot of, lot of great things that was happening. You know, Liberia was part of the formation of the United Nations. Yeah. Um, Liberia was, was, it's always been a world history right there because of how, it's almost like right. it, it grew up with his older brother. Um, right. Up to this point, right on the cutting edge of everything. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, let's take a. We'll take a break, and when we come back, um, we'll discuss your experiences during the Civil War. You were eight years old yeah. and witnessed all sorts of things. That's right. So, we'll be back in a moment. Hi, and we're back with uh, Kwanu Kwane. So we're talking uh, about his book, Witness, a Civil War Seen Through the Eyes of a Child. Um, now, in the earlier part of this episode, we set the stage with Liberian history, um, and we got up to a Civil War starts. Yeah. Um, now, you're eight years old, and yeah. to you, things are peaceful and going fine. That's right. So why don't you tell us about... Uh, your experience, and we'll so, kind of run through. At eight years old, growing up in Liberia was the, one of the best time of my life, um, you know, because at that time, my parents were really successful. Um, they had built the family wealth. They had worked really hard. They are indigenous Liberian who lived mm -hmm. with American Liberians uh, mm -hmm. to get education. Um, Your father ran, had a pharmacies, right? Yes, my, my father and mother um, established pharmacies um, throughout Liberia. Um, and grew that business to a great success in the late 80s. Um, and mm -hmm. it was then that my, my father got the opportunity to finally um, come to America, apply for a biz business visa to be able to come here and establish um, connections with um, companies to be able to supply his pharmacies in Liberia. Mm -hmm. That was the highlight of our family. My parents had bought uh, land on top of a hill, built two houses um, mm -hmm. in a place called Sugar Hill. It was the most beautiful community um, at that time that I could ever imagine. It was free flow. It was where I, I found my pride and joy uh, growing up in Liberia. You brought electricity um, to the community and lit it all up. That's right? right. My father, my parents brought electricity to my community. They, they were very innovative people. They were all about development. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, you know, they laid the first road going up to the hill um, in my mm -hmm. community. Um, so they did, they did a lot of things to establish life. Um, and uh, little did we know, though, that all of what they were doing would come to ruin. Uh, my father had got his visa to come to America. Um, mm -hmm. He was only supposed to be here for one month. Um, when he got here, the very next week, we had war to our doorsteps. My father was separated from us um, for five years. Um, he had no clue that we were even alive um, during that time because when the war came, we had to quickly leave everything that we had on Sugar Hill, run to Monrovia to try to take a refuge mm -hmm. um, in the capital city, hoping that the government of Liberia would protect us when we go to Monrovia. Um, on this journey, um, when we got to Monrovia, the, whole, the other anticipation was that our father would come back because the airport, the major airport is in Monrovia, the mm -hmm. capital city of Liberia, um, that he would come back to us and then we would somehow escape to Sierra Leone or to a neighboring country together as a family. We took refuge out of my church, um, at a church in Monrovia called uh, Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it was during this time that uh, we, we really, the war came to our doorsteps uh, in Monrovia. Um, and so up until this point, you've heard rumors and whispers among the adults yeah. that things are happening. Yeah. But well, you haven't really seen anything yet. No, we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, right. It was a lot of um, tension that was rising, rising up from, mm -hmm. from adults, uh, just just talking about the tension of what they felt in the country. Mm -hmm. Of course, as a child, you know, you, you, you can only feel 
the tension of not being able to play longer, you know. Right. Um, but for, for us, it was when the adults would get around the radio to talk about um, just the news of the day, you know, everything that we were hearing on the news. Um, you know, kind of like, almost like here right now, you know, in the mm -hmm. United States, so much going on in our country, in the U.S. right now with uh, whether it's China or it's Iran or just uh, right. the government, people not talking to each other. As a child, you don't really think too much about it. Um, but for us in Liberia, it was more or less just watching growing up turn, tune to the radio every evening to hear about what was happening. And um, then suddenly, one night, one day, exactly, you're all like, we, we got to leave. We got to leave because um, the war came unexpectedly too quickly. Um, it wasn't something that anybody expected to, to even have in Liberia. People were in Liberia were really comfortable. They didn't even want to leave Liberia. Their life was good. Um, and all of a sudden, overnight, everything just went, went, to, went, went away. Um, and you wind up at this church. We had, it was we, one of the... Yeah. We wound up at the church in Monrovia. When we had to leave was when my auntie, who was living in Ganta, uh, where the wall actually came from Ganta, mm -hmm. came to visit us because they had to leave their home. And that's really when it became real for us. Uh, they were really doing well in Ganta when they got to Tobanga, where I was living, uh, and we, ho we hosted them. They brought the news about the traumatizing situation that was happening with how the rebels were invading the country. Right, and That's they're killing when, people. And... Exactly. They were starting to kill people. They were starting to adopt children. They were starting to just separate families, use mm -hmm. the kids as children soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a new thing for Liberia, you know, for kids to become right. soldiers. It was just not something that people fathom. Well, you saw them on a truck, right? That was yeah. when I remember one of the first experiences you described was seeing the haunted look and some of the faces of the children on this truck, and yeah. they had weapons. Yep, and Dole was, uh, the president at the time was not really helping. Um, if anything, he was escalating the problem for why um, people, the rise against him um, and... and mm -hmm. Unfortunately, too, there's a historical notion to this that readers can, can go and search for themselves. Charles Taylor, who was um, in prison in Massachusetts, uh, mm -hmm. somehow escaped federal prison and found himself in Liberia to start a civil war. In prison in the United States. Yes. And shows up and starts a civil war in Liberia. In Liberia. Or participates in Participates. Yeah. Really, he, he, he was. So anyways, um, he's in Liberia. He, he starts to recruit all these people. Um, to fight. Um, and of course, the patriotism to join him was also high um, mm -hmm. because Doe was, was sending soldiers to Nimba County um, and they were killing um, these families, taking their children and carrying them to, to Monrovia and he was executing them. Um, so all of this was happening. And one of the chapters in the book, my mother and I goes to uh, talk to my father um, he, she's going to telecom to call my dad uh, mm -hmm. to a telecommunication place in, in Banga City, and I forced myself to follow her. Um, the book really takes you, uh, my character in the book is, I've, I've, I've always been curious, mm -hmm. so um, I'm following my mother and I'm begging her that I want to go with her wherever she goes, um, and we are going across this, this road, this main intersection, that's when we see these army trucks um, coming from Nimba, Another, the neighboring county with all, as the army trucks are going, of course, people are stopping on the road to figure out what's happening. Um, in the back of the trucks, I feel with a bunch of kids um, who has been uh, adopted by, um, mm -hmm. by the president and the army. And, and w the rumor is that um, their parents were executed um, mm -hmm. and he was transporting them uh, to either torture or execute these kids um, in Monrovia. Whatever the case was, uh, it was traumatizing. That was my first encounter of, of seeing the, the drama of what was happening around us. You know, we mm -hmm. hear about it, but it, didn't, it did not become real until those trucks were rolling through my city um, to take those kids, and I could see their eyes um, in the back of the trucks, and the fright of, the, I was frightened. Uh, of course, mother was always protective in, in those moments. Um, so those, that, that was my first encounter of, of seeing it being so real to us. And then you wind up hiding out in a church for what was a few weeks, right? Yes. So when we got to Monrovia, after we left Banga City, um, we get to Monrovia, we leave everything because 
Um, we hear about the tension that the rebels have took over Ganta. And right. from Ganta to Banga, where my home is, it's only like less than 45 minutes. Um, so drive. And um, so we're like, okay, we have to leave here. So we'll leave to go to Monrovia, anticipating that my father would come back um, and that he will be coming soon and that we would then escape the country. We take refuge at a church in Monrovia. It was at this church um, where we pretty much become hostage uh, because we are forced to go through curfews. The government incites mm -hmm. a nationwide curfew that uh, nobody can come outside after a certain time during the day. Um, and that anybody who they see, they will pretty much kill them. Um, mm -hmm. So we are stuck in this church for only a few hours to explore out, outside during the day. My father, meanwhile, um, has not come back yet. Um, we are waiting to hear news about him coming back, and then we hear that all planes are, 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 are not coming. There's no air traffic coming back to Liberia. And so everything starts to really, really rise up quickly. Um, and so we get the realization that dad is not coming back. Um, so my mother is left with five of us stuck in this church and have to fend for us. So it was in that church where we started to experience starvation. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't know how, uh, up to that point, I never knew how bad it was to be hungry. Um, and one night we got so hungry that my mother got news that there was another church that was distributing rice, that was distributing food. Mm -hmm. um, and she, the next morning, she got all of us to go and beg for food um, from that church and bring it back to our church. When we got to the Lutheran church, which was not too far away from this church, from my church, mm -hmm. um, we got to the Lutheran church, a long line. People are going to the church. People are being accepted into the church. But we got to the, to the gate um, where we were now going to beg for some food. We haven't eaten for literally for weeks up to this point. We haven't had a meal. Um, at least a decent meal at that point. Uh, we ran out of food altogether. So, you know, we're asking, my mother's asking the people at the gate if they can please give us some rice to take it back to our church. Um, and we are forbidden to get rice. And we couldn't understand why. And of course, we started to find out that the church was only taking in a certain tribe, uh, tribal group into the church. They were not taking everybody. If you are not of that tribe, they won't accept you to come into the church. So we beg and plead, of course, we're hanging on my mother and we are hungry. Um, and as we are begging, the minister of the church walks over um, and to find out what was going on. And he pretty much gave my mother an ultimatum and said, look, I understand uh, we can't take any other tribe in this church. What tribe are you? Of course, we call our tribe. And he says to her that um, um, the, he would take us into the church but he can't give us the bag of rice to take back to our church. Right. Um, and we started to beg um, that we could not just come into the church. We had a, our church family was still waiting right. for us. You had other people you couldn't abandon. We couldn't abandon. Either. And we, we, he, he looked at my mother and told her that, um, that we were not the chosen ones. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, of course, then he turned us away with no food, and we go back to our church uh, hungry. Um, the unfortunate part of the story is not even necessarily that we were hungry. It's the fact that um, the next morning we get news that the government has sent um, the army to that church, to the Lutheran church, and the massacre over 600 people with machetes that very night. Had we gone into the church, we would have been killed that night. If you had stayed well. there. That's right. Yeah. So even though, although we were not the chosen one to be killed, but unfortunately, the, the situation became that dire. And that was when my mother decided that even the churches were not safe no more. Well, people got killed at the church you were staying at as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so because the patrol soldiers were coming, there was the danger of rebels. That's right. You're hiding out every night. That's right. Wondering if they're going to come in and drag you out. That's right. So, um, and then... Your story obviously continues, and eventually you did make it out. But yeah. um, there were checkpoints that you had to yeah. go through. So, yeah, my mother decided that if we, we couldn't stay at this church no more. They were just becoming dangerous in the city. And uh, she decided that she was going to take us to war. So and the, the, at that time, when she made that decision, everybody at the church thought she was crazy, that we're hearing about the rumors outside of this church. We feel right. the tension in the city. 
Now, how are you going to escape here to go where? And her plan was that we were going to walk back to Banga City, which was about 130 miles walk, to go back to our home that we had left and go back into rebel territory. Um, her intuition was just that if we stay at the church, the government became that dangerous that we would right. die in the city. And mm -hmm. she was taking the risk of crossing over to rebel, and hopefully the right. rebels will have some pity on us. Crossing um, through territory that's controlled by, by different rebels. groups. Yeah. That's right. And um, this journey back was where it really becomes the book. Um, is the journey of, of me experiencing uh, losing my innocence as a child and really watching the most hideous things take place around in my environment. Um, and it was on this journey as we were leaving this church to go back um, that we made the first attempt to leave Monrovia and that was not successful. Um, and, but my mother was determined that we had to leave. And um, the very next night, she got us prepped again to try to leave Monrovia. And uh, when we finally escaped Monrovia and got into rebel territory, that's when everything started to go down south. Well, yeah. the book is certainly a tribute to the endurance of your mother. I mean, she it's incredible the, the things that, she, not just that you went through, but that she went through to hold the family together. And I, I encourage everyone, you should read this book. This, the, the journey is amazing. Yeah. What um, Q has just covered is just sort of the beginning, the first few chapters. Yeah. And there are uh, tales of killing fields. Your mother um, almost gets killed at one yeah. point. You think so, she, she was dead at one but point. That, that and, become the, I guess, the, the tipping point of our story is that when we finally got into rebel territory, um, we were captured at one of the checkpoints as we were going through, being interrogated about my father, about our tribe, and everything else. Um, by rebels, our first encounter of rebel soldiers was hideous. Um, it wasn't something that, as a child, I could ever fathom yeah. seeing children dressed in such um, demonic, possessed looking and feeling um, like they were nightmares. Um, the who have child been soldiers that are basically yes. capturing you. Yeah. yeah, that children have been turned in just that short period of time into animals. Um, and when we were being interrogated at one of the checkpoints, they didn't believe our story, and, um, and they told us we were good to go. And the word good to go just pretty much meant you were good to die. Mm -hmm. So they took us and ordered us to be taken to a killing field to be executed. And as we were confused about being good to go uh, and then going to being hauled out to a killing field, we started to cry for our life and started to really beg uh, to preserve us. And um, the rebel leader became really ignored and turned to my mother and says to her that, hey, um, everybody don't have to die today, but you get to choose who dies. So my mother had to choose between either our life or her life. And she chose to die so that we can live. And that's when they took her to the killing field to execute her. Um, that became the turning point um, for our story, for our life, because we're all five of us hanging on my mom, um, and at that moment, um, if mom is taken from us, more than likely we will be left in the mercy of, of, of these rebels. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and their intention was always to either turn the children into so children soldiers. Um, so when that took place, and my mother was hauled to this killing field to be executed, um, she didn't know that her decision to die was just as bad as us dying as well. Um, and while she was in the killing field, they ordered a 14 year old child with a machine gun to execute my mother. Um, and she, my mom realizing that a child was gonna execute her, started to reflect on us, on our life, that if she died, more than likely, um, somebody had to take care of us. Um, so she started to pray right in the middle of the killing field before she got executed. Um, they stripped her naked, and, uh, and the child was going to shoot her. And as she's standing there um, looking at this gun, she realized the innocence of this child. And she boldly started to pray um, a promise to God. Mm -hmm. And her promise in that moment was somehow, some way, if the bullet does not kill her, that would come from the gun, she promised to become a mother to a child like the one that was about to execute her. She realized that that child um, had parents. She realized that, that that child was an orphan. 
I'm more than likely they had killed the parents like they were about to kill her and she became mm -hmm. a child soldier. So she's just started to reflect that that child needed, child, children like those needed parents. Um, so her promise was just like that to God. And as she's saying the prayer, um, my little sister rips out of our hands and runs to the killing field to find my mother. And she finds her way to my mom. Right before she's shot, she runs there and grabs my mother. Um, and they're both standing in front of this gun um, by this child who is confused and bring the gun to the floor to whether or not to kill my mother and my, and my sister. And as she is in the middle of, of all of this, um, the rebel leader turns to the child and tells her to shoot both my mom and my sister. And um, you have to read I the think, rest of the book to I find think, out what happened. All right. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, okay. Well, th thank you very much uh, for coming on. You're going to stay with us. We're going to the we're going to do another episode, and it's going to be about Liberia today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll touch on briefly uh, the rest of your story because yeah. obviously you survived, and you're here to tell us about it. Yeah. Um, again, I highly recommend the book, and if you go to the uh, website, you can find out more information, and that, that uh, web address will be on the screen for you. Yep. Um, so that wraps it up for this episode of In the Studio, and uh, I'll be back with Q for uh, another episode shortly. Look out for it.